back to the 1970s, where we'll uncover some of the biggest automotive blunders of the decade. From the AMC Gremlin to the laughable Ford Pinto and the infamous Bricklin SV1, these cars are remembered for all the wrong reasons. So in this video, we'll be showcasing 13 car disasters that should have never been made. Number 13, the AMC Gremlin. From 1975 to 1980, it was a car that never quite grew into its name. Here's the thing, I appreciate what AMC was trying to do. The oil crisis was looming and gas prices were skyrocketing. People needed practical, fuel-efficient cars. But the Gremlin, cobbled together from leftover parts, ended up looking like a confused Frankenstein's monster of a car. The stubby rear stuck out like a sore thumb, and the whole thing just felt awkward on the road. Now, I'm not saying a car can't be practical and quirky, but the Gremlin just missed the mark. It wasn't cute or quirky, it was just weird. Maybe if they'd leaned harder into the oddball design, it could have found a niche. But as it was, the Gremlin landed with a thud, a reminder that practical doesn't have to mean sacrificing all sense of style. There were other cars in the 70s that found a way to be efficient and still have some personality. The Gremlin, well, it just became a cautionary tale. Number 12, the Chevrolet Chevette, 1976-87. The Chevette was the automotive equivalent of beige walls and bland music. Sure, it got the job done. It could take you from point A to point B. But man, was it a snooze fest. And here's the thing. I get it. The Japanese imports were taking the market by storm, offering efficiency and affordability. Chevy needed an answer. But the Chevette? Well, it felt like the absolute bare minimum effort. Chevette rolls off the tongue with all the excitement of watching paint dry. The performance, well, let's just say it wasn't known for its ability to win drag races. Look, I appreciate a good value proposition, but the Chevette felt like a chore to drive. Don't your passengers deserve a little more excitement than the rumbling of a cheap engine? There were other cars in the 70s that struck a balance between affordability and personality. The Chevette, it was the automotive equivalent of a participation trophy. You showed up, but there was no reward. Number 11, Ford Pinto, 1971-1980. The Pinto is one of those cars that leaves a bitter taste in my pistons, if you could imagine such a thing. But here's the deal. A car should be about freedom, about cruising down the open road. But the Pinto, well, it was a ticking time bomb. That whole exploding gas tank thing? Unforgivable. And it wasn't just a design flaw. It was a blatant disregard for safety. Cutting corners to save a few bucks could literally cost people their lives. Now, some might say it was a different time and regulations weren't as strict, but that doesn't excuse putting people at risk. A car should make you feel secure, not like you're straddling a potential inferno. The performance wasn't much to write home about either. Look, I'm all for affordability, but there is a line between budget-friendly and a complete safety hazard. Pinto crossed that line in a major way. It's a stark reminder that car companies have a responsibility to put safety first, no matter what. Number 10, the Leland Marina, 1971-80. Now, this was a car that Britain would probably rather forget. I'm not one for nationalism, but even I can admit this marina was a bit of a mess. Here's the thing. British Leland wasn't exactly known for its stellar quality control in the 70s, and the marina was a prime example. Rust seemed to be its best friend, and the whole car felt like it was constantly on the verge of falling apart. Don't get me wrong, I've seen some quirky British cars that I kinda dig, but the marina? Well, it wasn't even quirky in a charming way. The proportions were just off, like someone stretched a hatchback in all the wrong places. Maybe if it had been a bit more reliable, or if the design had been a touch more cohesive, it could have found a niche. But as it stands, the marina is a reminder that sometimes taking a chance on a new design backfires. It wasn't sporty, it wasn't practical, it wasn't particularly good looking. The marina was just there. And that in the world of cars is a fate worse than a breakdown. Number 9, the Bricklin SV1, 1974-75. Now this was a car with a split personality. Those gold wing doors, totally agree. They sound awesome. They scream futuristic sports cars, turning heads wherever you go. But then you see the rest of the car, and it's like someone took a futuristic spaceship and glued it onto a boring sedan. I appreciate innovation, but the execution here just feels off. Gimmicky doors don't make up for a clunky design. Maybe if they leaned harder into the futuristic look or toned down the doors and focused on a sleeker body, it could have worked. As it is, the Bricklin's a case that good intentions gone wrong. It's a reminder that sometimes chasing trends can lead you down a strange road. Number 8, Subaru GL, 1980-89. 
Now, the GL wasn't exactly a looker, that's for sure. It was an automotive equivalent of a beige sweater. Practical, maybe, but about as exciting as watching paint dry. I know some folks love their Subarus, and they've certainly earned a reputation for being reliable and capable cars. But the GL? It seems like they took that practicality to the extreme, sacrificing any sense of style in the process. Boxy shapes can be done well, but the GL just felt, well, too boxy. But even a little curve, a hint of design inspiration could have made a world of difference. The GL's a reminder that even practical cars can benefit from a touch of personality. Number 7, the Datsun F10, 1975 to 1980. This was a car that seemed to be trying to be everything to everyone and ended up being nothing special. Think of it as a chameleon that forgot how to blend in. Here's the thing, hatchbacks can be cool, sporty coupes can be fun, and even small sedans can have a certain charm, but the F10, it just felt confusing. The proportions were awkward, like a mismatch of different car types smushed together. Maybe if they focused on one design element and executed that well, the F10 could have found its niche, but instead it ended up being a jack of all trades and a master of none. Dotson was known for its reliable, well-designed cars, and the F10 felt like a bit of a misstep. It's a reminder that sometimes trying to do too many things at once can leave you with a car that's, well, forgettable. Number 6, the Matra Bagheera, 1973-80. This was a 70s disco dream on paper, mid-engine wedge shape that became a handling disaster on the dance floor. It's a cautionary tale that flashy features don't make a sports car. Imagine a poster child for the 70s, a mid-mounted engine, promising thrilling performance, and a wedge-shaped design that sliced through the wind. This had all the makings of a legend, but sadly it was a case of style over substance. The handling was twitchy and unpredictable, the interior cramped and uncomfortable, and the overall design felt like a mishmash of cool ideas that never quite gelled. True sports cars are a harmonious blend of power, handling, and design. The big hero? Well, it was a confused pretender to the throne. All looks and no moves. Number 5, the American Motors Pacer, 1975-80. The AMC Pacer wasn't just a car, it was a rolling eccentricity. You gotta admire AMC's boldness. That wide oval window and bulbous rear were like nothing else on the road. But let's be honest, it looked like a goldfish bowl with wheels. I appreciate a car that stands out from the crowd, I really do, but the Pacer went from quirky to comical. It was like a caricature of a car, all exaggerated lines and awkward proportions. Maybe if they toned down the uniqueness a bit, it could have been a fun, funky ride. But as it was, the Pacer became a symbol of the 70s gone wrong, a reminder that sometimes out there doesn't translate to outright cool. Number 4, the Triumph TR7, 1975-81. This was supposed to be the heir to the legendary TR6. Big shoes to fill, right? Well, the TR7 fumbled and tripped its way out of the starting gate. Sure, the wedge-shaped design was all the rage in the 70s, but on the TR7, it looked tacked on, like a budget afterthought. The execution felt clumsy, the proportions awkward. Maybe if they stayed true to the classic TR6 lines and incorporated some subtle, modern touches, it could have been a worthy successor. Number 3, the Chevrolet Monza, 1974-80. The Chevy Monza always struck me as a car that wanted to be a Camaro but couldn't quite pull it off. It had a similar sporty look, but it lacked the power and performance to back it up. It was a decent looking car, but it wasn't exactly what you'd call a head turner. It seemed more practical than exciting. If I was looking for a sporty Chevy from the 70s, I'd probably go for a Camaro instead. It's a true classic with the muscle to match its looks. Number 2, the Renault Fuego. Now this always struck me as a car that was very much ahead of its time. The wedge-shaped design was popular in the 80s, but it feels a bit dated today. It kind of reminds me of a futuristic car from an old sci-fi movie. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate the boldness of the design. It definitely stands out from the crowd, but to me, it looks a bit clunky and awkward. Maybe if they toned down the wedge a little bit, it would have aged better. And number one, the Yugo GV. The Yugo GV. Oof. This car had a bit of a cult following these days, but for all the wrong reasons. It was known for being about as reliable as a rusty swing set, and about as exciting to drive as a toaster. Let's just say if you were looking for a car that would get you from point A to point B relatively cheaply, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos, because we've got plenty more fascinating car content coming your way.